Simon White first observed the sky on a mountain telescope in Chile. It was quite extraordinary because the sky seemed so bright because in fact it was extremely dark. You really sort of feel how small we are and uh, you begin to feel there is some kind of connection between what we do and something which is much bigger out there. Simon was born in Kent but grew up in Cornwall, England. My mother was a housekeeper and I never knew my father. We are living in a very rural place. I was mostly interested in the flowers and the birds and walking around and learning stuff. The local county psychologist arranged for me to go to a boarding school in Sussex. I became interested in science and languages and mathematics. And also, for a while, I played the violin. He won a scholarship to study applied maths at Cambridge University. It's a natural consistency in mathematics, which I, I enjoy. Mathematics is how you understand the wonders of space. He obtained his master's in astrophysics in Toronto, but fascinated about a PhD in maths or astronomy back at Cambridge. The applied maths department was in the basement in the centre of town, in a rather unpleasant place. The Astronomy Institute was outside town in a new building, much pleasanter, so I decided to go into astrophysics. To study how structure the universe develops in time, you have to understand whether your mathematical model really can describe the phenomena you see. And so, uh, computers came to take a major role in this. He researched what constitutes dark matter that fills most of the universe. I thought the way to do this was to try and understand how galaxies and galaxy clusters form. I set up a calculation inside the computer, which was a spherical region in the, the uniform universe, which was expanding. And then as the calculation evolved, it became lumpier and lumpier, and all these lumps eventually fell back together to make a single cluster of galaxies. And what we learn from this is how inhomogeneous this structure formation process was. His simulations were later proven by pictures from the Einstein X-ray Observatory. This was, uh, from my point of view, was, was lucky. Simon was a postdoc, researcher and professor in Britain, the US and France. He and colleagues became the first to disprove an idea dark matter comprised of pure elementary particles called neutrinos. We started looking at a family of particles called cold dark matter, which have different initial conditions coming out of the Big Bang on the neutrinos. In many simulations published in the 1980s, they... ...eventually demonstrated relatively convincingly that many aspects of the real galaxy distribution could be understood from cold dark matter. It was still quite controversial because, after all, we were claiming that most of the matter in the universe is in the form of elementary particle that's never been seen in any accelerator and is not required. Their simulations also revealed dark matter halos surrounding space objects. We discovered all the dark matter halos, although they all form in different ways around different objects, they nevertheless all have a similar structure and that you can describe this in a very simple way now is called the Navarro Frank White Profile. In 2005, Simon and colleagues started a very large simulation known as Millennium. To model the formation of the whole population of galaxies inside individual simulations of the dark matter distribution. But it turned out the distribution of the galaxies inside the simulated universe is actually very close to the distribution of galaxies in the real universe. You really can see very deeply into things. He has an incredible memory. He can uh, really cite uh, like commas of some of his papers. If you go to him and ask him questions, he has with 99% certainty always an answer. He's a uh, very smart, so a brilliant person. Simon works still is the backbone of a lot of the things we're doing today. He's such a critical mind that he can formulate important questions, even in fields that might not directly relate to his daily work. If life develops naturally, then there could be present in many environments throughout the universe that look like the Earth. I study space because I'm interested to, to understand how our universe evolved, quite independent of the quest of life. In 1994, Simon moved to Munich and became a director at the Max Planck Institute. I felt close to European culture, so I wanted to come back to Europe. Simon's astrophysicist wife, Guinevere Kaufman, is also a director here. He was her PhD supervisor at Cambridge. 
Guinevere's Shanghai-born mum had lived in Hong Kong. Her father is an American physicist. Guinevere did her postdoc at Berkeley. But uh, living transatlantic apart was uh, difficult. We went to, uh, to Marrakesh. You proposed in Marrakesh. I proposed. Well, we also accepted. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we got married in Cambridge. <laughs> I think uh, excellence and uh, ultimate commitment, yeah, that's uh, what Simon taught me. It was admirable that she found her own scientific profile, which is clearly independent of mine. Oh, I like to go and do other things and try and uh, forget about the office, go home, have dinner, go out to a concert, go hiking. When son Jonathan was born in 1996, they installed a computer in our basement where I could log on here, and that was life-saving. Jonathan is studying history and politics in university. Dad was always very good at just saying, whatever you're passionate about, do that. <laughs> he was around a lot, um, lots of fun. I got to go traveling with him a lot. What I picked up from my dad most was a love for reading and a natural curiosity about the world. Simon speaks several European languages. When I was an undergraduate, I spent about two or three summers actually traveling around Europe going to museums. I got particularly interested in Renaissance art from Holland and Belgium. It's important to be honest when you're doing science about what it does explain and in particular about what it does not explain. By now I have about 500 published papers. So I have over 100,000 citations at this point. I stopped formally being a director in two years' time, but I don't expect to stop doing astronomy. What do you think was so special to you about France? Well, you know, I think maybe I always felt freer there. I think I would have liked to have grown up in France in some ways. In 1973, he and Givens and wife Barbara took a break from studying the motor protein dining at the University of Hawaii's Marine Lab. They went with their children to France on sabbatical. It was a year that had a left a large impression on Mm -hmm. on all of us as a family because it was such a wonderful year. It was transformative, I think, yeah. I was 10 or 11 and so really quickly just started picking up French and I think it, it made me realize what my mind could do, which was actually kind of an intellectual awakening for me. As kids, Peter and Wendy grew up with music. Pete, do you remember and, uh, the folk songs? Yeah. <laughs> well, the Irish washerwoman and all of those, yes. So I took piano lessons. Yeah. And Dad, this was pretty much Dad's thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think my mom would play the piano, or sometimes I would, and we would sing yeah. folk songs. Yeah. We had a book of folk sing, songs sing as a family. Barbara was a serious musician, part of chamber music groups in Hawaii and then in the Bay Area. And as a family, the Gibbons would hike and camp. We would spend about four weeks um, camped up in the Sierras. We wanted a, a break from Hawaii. We wanted to be somewhere cool for the summer. The real break from Hawaii came in 1997. Ian and Barbara moved to the San Francisco Bay Area. Barbara left science. Ian continued at Berkeley in Beth Burnside's lab. He wanted to move to the Bay Area because his kids lived here. And so he contacted me and asked if there was any way he could work in my lab. And I was thrilled at the possibility because he'd always been one of my science heroes. That led to collaborations with Ron Vale. The two had first worked together on a paper in the late 1980s in Hawaii. There were two more papers in the Bay Area. The one in Journal of Biological Chemistry, Ian was a uh, first author and was a really important paper because it proposed with data a very important model about how dining works. These collaborations with Ron's lab have been really very, very helpful to me since uh, I am was in this semi-retired status. Because when I retired from Hawaii, I no longer had a big research team. I had one person working with me most of that time, Joan Garbarino, who brought me up to date in the new 
procedures in molecular biology and taught me those as her student while she was in my lab. I answered an ad and I guess when I said, let's do some science, you know, he thought that was good. And so <laughs> I ended up working with him for quite a long time. It was very satisfying, actually, toward the end when it kind of wrapped up in the big paper that we did with the Vail Lab because Ian had been working on dining for so long that it was very satisfying that we were able to actually get some of the structure of the molecule itself. He's just a really strong person. Um, and his personality is just very, very strong and very persistent. Um, he just really does not give up on stuff. And I think one kind of way that, I, that we've seen that recently that's out, actually outside of the lab um, was when he was taking care of my mom when she had Parkinson's, because she had Parkinson's for, what was it, like? Eight years. Longer than that. Like well, that was longer, yeah. 14 but... years. Barbara, for you. We had 50 years together before she died of Parkinson's. So basically, they have this peptide series. Um, Ron Vale's lab near downtown San Francisco has gone beyond motor protein work. I want to learn how the intestine maintains itself during adulthood. But has not left it behind, certainly not dining. Wang Yuxiao is studying how dynein works in T cells, cells that fight disease, including cancer. How dynein have this awareness of the state of the cell and determine basically what cargo to load and when to load the cargo and does it drive fast or slow and does it stop? Why all these dynein molecules, they all congregate or cluster at one area and what is going on in that one focal point. We know the tracks all lead there. I don't know what they are doing there. So that is a fascinating question we are trying to figure out. And there remain basic questions about how dynein walks along microtubules. And it's very important that it coordinates its stepping so that only one leg detaches at a time because otherwise the motor would lose contact to the track and then would not be able to carry the cargo to where it's supposed to go. Back as an undergrad in Germany, I was studying physics, but then for summer school I was preparing for a motor seminar session and I watched the videos from Ron on iBiology about motor proteins, which really got me very excited about biophysics. So in the microtubule world, there are two main types of cytoskeletal motors. One are... Ron started iBiology lectures about 10 years ago. Too much expert knowledge was being lost, he says, when elite scientists spoke only to other elite scientists. It just felt like there has to be a better way of doing it. There has to be ways of democratizing knowledge so it's not really cloistered within elite institutions. There are now some 500 of these presentations on YouTube. Climate change is probably the defining challenge of the 21st century. And they can be seen on the mainland. They've started their own program called iBioChina, and they're reposting, uh, with our encouragement, these videos on WeChat and making it accessible um, through other vehicles there. And so the fact that your skin test positive doesn't mean you have TB infection now, it means... It's really some of the best scientists in the world, Nobel Prize winners, uh, members of the National Academy of Sciences, you know, the, the Royal uh, Society, etc. Yes. Heart beating, good. I think his dream is to make science accessible to anyone who wants it, to have the scientists tell their stories and their science in a way that's understandable. Some of his outreach is geared toward people that he knows have never had the opportunities or the resources that he has to do science. Ron chose India for a nine-month sabbatical in 2007. It struck me at India, maybe there are a few things that I could do personally that would actually be useful and helpful. I was working in a lab of Dr. G2 Mayer there, and we've had a long-lasting science collaboration since. I set up 
with colleagues at National Center for Biological Science is a course in microscopy of sufficient quality that people would come from the U.S. and Europe to take that course. It's now, I think, in its ninth year. There is also an annual event called the Young Investigators Meeting. The spirit of this meeting was really to think about the next generation of scientific leaders in India, mainly young scientists. Bring them together for about a five-day meeting. Also bring Indian postdocs. So these are individuals who've gone through a lot of training and now are poised to start their own independent laboratories. Ron himself had an opportunity early in life to get a flying start at a career in science. He grew up in Hollywood, California. I had a wonderful high school counselor who helped get me into a biology lab when I was in high school. So I worked in a biology lab at UCLA as a high school student doing my own project, which was amazing. Now he says his time is split between the work in his lab and science education farther afield. There remains time for exercise outside his back door in Marin County. Marin is really one of the most spectacular places in the sense that it has so much beautiful, protected wilderness and open space in such close proximity to a major city. I take advantage of over the weekend just by hiking, trail running, mountain biking. These are things I like to do for fun, and they're very close when you're living in Marin. And he's close enough to visit old friends. I would just say sharing the Shaw Prize together is really a great culmination of a wonderful friendship mm -hmm. for many, many years. The fact that I could, you know, break this news to you know, my great friend Ian was also made this whole experience very special to me. It's been, <clears throat> it's been a wonderful experience, I think. I'm very happy, certainly, to be honored by the recognition of this prize. And I think it's very appropriate that it been recognized as the importance of molecular motor proteins and that, uh, in the cell, in so many things that they do in the cell, the many roles they play in, in the uh, human health and problems of human health. These two motors collaborate inside the cell um, and we've collaborated together as scientists so maybe there's there's something fitting in all of this. Absolutely. In his mid-twenties, Ron Vale, a co-winner of this year's Shaw Prize for Life Science and Medicine, discovered the motor protein kinesin. That work has shaped his whole career in science. By the time he was 27, he had his own lab at the University of California, San Francisco, without ever doing a postdoctoral fellowship. I got offers at the time from uh, Harvard and Johns Hopkins and Stanford and UCSF. I think in most of those cases, even I'm not sure I even applied to those places. Ron had been a graduate student at Stanford studying to be a medical doctor and a researcher. This kinesin story developed, I would say, halfway through my training. Kinesin is one of three main motor proteins and the last one discovered. These generate all the motion that is associated with life inside of you. As a neuroscience student, Ron had wondered how it was the components in neurons or nerve cells were transported. They are the longest cells in the body. A neuron that may be innervating your toe, for example, the main part of that cell actually starts in your spinal cord. The imagination was, well, maybe there are little motors that are carrying these building blocks up and down that nerve cell. So our first guess was that the motor that was moving things in your muscle was also moving things in the nerve cell. The motor protein responsible for muscle contraction is called myosin. It was the first motor protein discovered. Ron crossed the U.S. to continue research at the Marine Biology Lab in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. The lab there had squid, a useful model organism because it has a giant nerve fiber, or axon. The squid giant axon is actually visible 
to your eye. You can dissect it out of the squid. And because it's so large, it's just much more easy to study and manipulate than the axon from a mammal. If a car represents a motor protein delivering cargo on a roadway, Ron learned early on that deliveries made in the squid giant axon used a different road than myosin uses. Goods in the squid axon ran on what's called a microtubule track. The second motor protein discovered, called dynein, also uses a microtubule track. Ron then used a microtubule track in experiments where plastic beads played the role of cargo being transported in the cell. We could get rid of the natural cargo, the cell's natural cargo, and put in a completely artificial cargo, a very small plastic manufactured bead. To make it run, they then added some of the soupy mixture of proteins from the squid axon. There was at least some part of that motor that was floating around in the soup and could attach, luckily, to the plastic bead, thinking it was like a cargo and moving it along these tracks. That was a critical moment that we knew we had something, and more importantly, that we knew we could figure out what the motor was. It was another two years before they published the paper saying they could report the partial purification of a new motor protein, kinesin. The main work on kinesin would go on into the 2000s. It turns out there are 45 different kinesins, some of them unrelated to transport within cells. Probably about 15 of them are involved in processes of cell division because these, both the roadways and the motor proteins are involved in the physical separation of the DNA, they have been targets for cancer chemotherapy. Part of what Ron Vale first knew about motor proteins came from the earlier work of this year's other Life Science Prize winner, Ian Gibbons. When did we first meet? Was it at Hawaii or did we meet at a conference or? I don't remember. I mean, I knew about your work already, you know, soon after it happened. Alongside Ian Gibbons from his days at Harvard, through his retirement as a scientist at Berkeley, was Barbara, whom he married in 1961. She would eventually join his lab. She helped me organize myself, and um, she helped my, me organize my science. She helped me keep my writing intelligible to other people. And, um, yeah, kept me stable, I would say. Ian was training grad students as an electron microscopist while pursuing his own work at the same time. In 1959, he started research on the structure of cilia and flagella, like the waving tail on the end of a sperm. What drives it are a package of fibers that run along the length of the tail. And these had only been described the previous two or three years when I started. Barbara, at the time, was a protein chemist working as a lab technician. She made me realize it would be extremely helpful for me if I could get in to the protein, what was the nature of the proteins in these wonderful structures that I had become interested in. He started experiments on the single-cell tetrahamina, a ciliate common in freshwater ponds. By 1963, he found the structure underlying cilia was a cylindrical cable, a microtubule. Comparatively little was known about them at the time. In this cross-section, there is a pair of filaments in the middle, surrounded by nine more pairs forming the outer part of the tube. These filaments slide, and Ian had isolated the protein, shown here as dynein arms, that made the sliding possible. I had it in the test tube, I'd go ahead and look at it. And it wasn't completely pure, but it was certainly 80 or 90% pure. When we got it pure enough, we gave it the name of dynein. He had also been working to identify the protein that made up microtubules. Other labs were too. Someone else came along um, with more courage and, and um, gave it the name tubulin. That was Hideo Mori at the University of Tokyo. Ian was hired to work at the University of Hawaii in 1967. 
where there were more sea urchins, his new model organism, to better understand dynein. Ian had shown through experiments he filmed that it was dynein causing sperm tails to move. I was at the meeting of the cell biology organization when he and Barbara, his wife, gave the presentation where they described the first time that they had removed dynein and, put, and lost the motility of flagella and then put the dynein back and regained the. Dynein needs a chemical fuel called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, in order to work. And it works even when the heads have been taken off the sperm. At the end of the presentation, after he showed the movie of the sperm tails swimming away, after he added back the ATP, the whole audience leapt to their feet, clapping and yelling and applauding. It was wonderful. It was, a, it was a scene I'll never forget. It was one of those peak experiences in biology. And there were more experiments filmed showing the movement of microtubules. We were the first to observe that sliding movement, so your pattern of sliding of microtubules. It was a very dramatic film. A graduate student of mine, Keith Summers at Honolulu, had the idea of weakening the general structure by using a digestive enzyme and then adding ATP. We were able to see the flagella atonine actually tear itself to pieces. And the way it did it was by extending itself out, sliding, one part of it sliding over another part. Ian's work in Hawaii, while he and his lab partner wife raised two young children, remained with the dynein found in flagella, even as dynein was discovered in the cytoplasm of cells, opening up far more research. Dynein was a large complicated molecule, but it was not possible for us at that stage to handle all the details of such a large molecule. That would have to come later. On the left is dynein. On the right, kinesin. The further work on dynein showed that dynein and kinesin run on microtubule tracks in the cytoplasm of cells, but in opposite directions. Kinesin from the center of the cell outward and dynein toward the middle. A mutation in dynein can lead to neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I use it enormously in nerve axons, so all the arms and the legs where you have extended long axons. There is one mutation in dynein that destroys some of its function, and people who suffer that mutation, uh, they have a number of medical problems. Um, one is that they usually in, they're infertile. When we come back, now this sliding motion of the two uh, microtubules uh, in the cilia gets converted into the sinusoidal beating pattern by a process that's still uh, very uh, poorly understood. Ron Vale worldwide science educator. Now it's viewed in, you know, over 175 countries around the world. There's actually a really big following in China. I am Claire Rosin, I am a mathematician. I like in math uh, everything that I don't like in life. <laughs> That is, you are extremely free, there is no hierarchy. You have to dream, you have to imagine, you have to be curious. Then I discovered algebraic geometry, which has an extremely beautiful uh, theoretical body, a world where I can uh, enter and I'm uh, totally uh, fully involved. In 2016, Claire became the first female mathematician and chair of algebraic geometry at Collège de France. Claire's PhD thesis was on Hodge theory. There are really many deep uh, things to, to be done with the Hodge uh, structure. So. The Hodge decomposition theorem tells us that when we know our variety as an algebraic variety or as a complex manifold equipped with a Keller metric, we have a decomposition of this Betti homology. It's not with Z coefficient. I prove that. Uh, this, is, this theorem is not true anymore. For some compact Keller manifolds, starting from dimension four, I look at, at, at the, the possible Hodge structures, and I show that none of them correspond to a complex projective uh, variety. She's like the incarnation of Hodge theory in France and uh, largely abroad, one of the greatest mathematicians of our time, to my, uh, to my opinion. 
Claire spent 30 years at the CNRS, National Centre for Scientific Research in Paris, making vital discoveries. In projective algebraic varieties... In the case of, uh, of surfaces, that is uh, dimension 2, Kodaira says that uh, any uh, compact color uh, surface is a, a deformation of uh, projective surface. What I proved the result is not true in a higher dimension. There exist uh, compact color manifolds in any dimension of at least uh, four, which cannot be obtained from complex projective manifold by, just by this deformation process, because there are topological obstructions to that. She's, I think, one of the best, probably the best uh, specialist of the uh, interaction between Keller geometry and part theories. The green conjecture predicts if you know all the minimal degrees that you get here, you are able to compute CCGs. Claire's theorem on green was proved in two parts, first one between 2001 and 05. I proved that uh, green uh, conjecture for uh, CCGs of uh, canonical curves is true for uh, generic curves. You have all these curves which are here. Maybe you have to remove a number of subvarieties, but the result will be true for all curves which lie in this big open set. In 2015, Claire proved there are uh, unirational but uh, non stably rational varieties. With a trivial uh, unramified cohomology, I use uh, this notion of decomposition of the diagonal, which is a necessary condition for, uh, for stable rationality, and I proved that it, it behaves uh, very well. It gives many new invariants to study that problem. The conjecture is almost completely solved now, uh, thanks to her. Claire is very good at uh, having new ideas more people can work with. She always has been a role model for us. Her main contribution is not to just work in a single discipline, but uh, to have a, a broad vision. She likes good wines. <laughs> she likes music. I mean, she's very serious, but she can be relaxed also. In 1982, Claire was writing her PhD thesis when she met Jean-Michel Caron, a math researcher, in a ballroom. No, at the first uh, sight. <laughs> Oh, very nice. Was it for you also? Possibly, yes. Because she, she is beautiful. I was very impressed by her uh, intellect. He was uh, extremely civilized, extremely okay. polite. Did you handsome. think he was handsome? Oh, yeah, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly, he organized a travel to, uh, to Florence in Italy. He had a culture uh, of ancient uh, art, which was uh, impressive. At that time, she, she was uh, painting, and I, I liked very much uh, her work. We got married in 1984, uh, and uh, we are very happy. I don't think I, uh, I had a very happy uh, childhood. Claire's parents were in their 40s when she was born in Ile-de-France, the 10th of 12 children. We, as, as, a, as small children, we, we were obviously totally unimportant. <laughs> I had a very dark uh, view of the existence when I met uh, Jean-Michel, and I would never have uh, imagined that uh, my life would be so extraordinary, full of uh, love, uh, full of life. Hey, regarde, Marie. Regarde, I discovered the childhood growing up my own children. Five kids within 10 years, and now a grandchild. You know, mathematics, you never stop uh, thinking. I was working in the morning and Jean-Michel was working in the afternoon. <laughs> During Sunday, we gathered uh, at uh, five to see the movie and then we had a, a dinner together. Uh, and we, we read uh, in uh, our parents' room uh, all together. We, we found a great uh, pleasure uh, doing things together. And I made this, this one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
until I was uh, 40, and, uh, I was most of the time at home, apart from uh, conferences. It's uh, the recognition, the, the academic world, which pushes traveling, living home. I don't know anything about uh, our work. Are you proud of what your mother has achieved? Uh, yes, very, very much. She always wants us to be active, and uh, she's also um, quite um, demanding. demanding. When we were young, there was um, an activity where we each one of us uh, invented a, a story, and we must put something weird in the story. We spend but also with uh, effort on uh, uh, the sense of doing something that is useful. If she sees that uh, we are happy, so she's happy for us. Our mother always tries to encourage creativity. Mm. I guess that's why uh, one of the reasons why I, I want to, to work in the film industry. I am a applied mathematician. I'm working in uh, control theory. Recently, both Claire and Jean-Michel were invited to work at the Institute for Theoretical Research at ETH in Zurich. I have essentially three books, 80 research papers. The questions that I like the, the most are those where I have absolutely no idea at the beginning how to do questions where we, we have no tools. But uh, how the ideas come, it's really, it's always a mystery. When Janusz Kalar flies into Hong Kong for the Sharp Prize ceremony, he'll likely look up at the roof of the passenger terminal. He told us, among the images of buildings and structures he's seen in Hong Kong, he finds the roof here the most interesting. When he looks at the roof, he sees patterns of elliptical lines. I worked on, on exactly understanding the type of surfaces where made up of two, three, or more grids of ellipses. To me, it's very nice to see that, that these are actually used and they are constructed. At the airport, he doesn't think this roof design is simply decorative. Uh, I believe it is structural. Janusz has been in the math department at Princeton University for 18 years. Before that, he spent a dozen years at the University of Utah. He's always been fascinated by shapes and the relationship between algebra and geometry. We try to understand geometry using algebra and try to understand algebra using geometry. I'm especially interested in the cases where the shape is very sensitive to small changes of the numbers. Like the lemniscate of Bernoulli. x to the 4 plus 2x squared y squared plus y to the 4 equals x squared minus y squared. So it looks like a nice figure eight. It goes around and it comes back here and back, okay? Now, a small change in the equation. What happens if I add it to it a plus 0 0.1? Turns out I get something that hugs the figure eight from the inside. So I get something like this, and I also get the same thing at the other side. This is very close to the figure eight, but instead of making, of being made out of just one piece of metal, it's suddenly made out of two pieces. And the blue lines don't intersect. What happens if I subtract 0 0.1 from it? Well, then I again get something that will hug the figure eight, but this time it will hug it from the outside. So that means you get something that looks like this. So again, you say it's a figure eight. This it doesn't have this part where it intersects. You can think of it as a circle where the, you're trying to bring the top and the bottom together. Janos is known by other mathematicians as an original thinker. This idea of what he calls rationally connected varieties, which he read a whole book about, that was really a brand new insight. The overall subject of when varieties are rational or unirational goes back at this point 150 years. But this was a really new approach to it. 
There was his work with Mori early on on minimal models, classification of three-dimensional varieties. And he disproved a very long-standing conjecture of John Nash, who both won a Nobel Prize in economics and a Arbor Prize. It really built on the earlier work that he had done with Mori. He used everything they had developed in, in three dimensions to then plug in and disprove this long-standing open conjecture. As a grad student, Stanford's Ravi Vakil attended a Janos lecture. His ideas were really simple. He didn't complicate things. He simplified things. But he was talking about such subtle things that, that you had to pay attention to every word and, and, and the 10 or 15 words that were behind every word. Even before I started graduate school, he was the greatest algebraic geometer in the field, and he still is. He's, on one hand, seen as kind of an unstoppable machine, technically. He's mentally stronger than others, and then there's a, a hill to go around, he will just go right through it, but he also has finesse as well. As a graduate student at Brandeis University, Janos met his future wife, Jennifer, who is also now a mathematician at Princeton. If I'm in the same room when he's working, then I, I can't think about anything else because it, it looks like something is going to explode over there. And this can go on for quite a while. It's like an illness that occasionally you have these attacks. I'm attacked by mathematics and then for three weeks, weeks I'm ill. <laughs> I mean, it's not a good analogy because because I enjoyed it, yeah, so, and, 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 and I think it's very useful at the end. Janos is the only member of his family in North America. He left his native Hungary after university when the country was still under communist rule. He did not imagine returning. It's clear they would have at least taken away my passport, you know, I would have had a very hard time getting a job. He was the eldest of six children. He was day and night on the mathematics. We told him that there is a breakfast, or we told him there is dinner. He came out, he did not speak one single word, ate something quickly and went back. Today is much better. Janos is surrounded by engineers. That includes his brother Peter, his parents, and now his daughter Alicia, an electrical engineer. I still don't understand what he does, but, you know, a lot of the... So I think what he would consider sort of basic early grad school math actually sort of turns up a lot in my work. And so then we start discussing. He is known to be a very tough teacher, not only to graduate students, but also to undergraduate students. I'm surprised to learn now he is among our best undergraduate teacher. Student in his calculus class nominated him for outstanding teaching award. He still keeps his very tough, high standard. People really value his opinion, so, you know, you want him to have a good opinion of you, and that's where people are intimidated. Well, what I especially like when I teach a class of non-mathematicians, and then at the end of the year, one or two students, they usually come to me that, well, I would like to be a mathematician now. 